I've done my research. My outline's finished. I'm all set up, ready to go, film my next video. When I see Amazon and the Rings of Power have gone and put their foot in their mouth again. I'm talking about that GQ article that dropped this week. And you all know, I can't let that slide on by without adding my two cents. I can attack so I cast. Most of the article is your typical PR fluff piece. Hey, we got to go on set. It looks so amazing. We got to talk to the actors and actresses. They told us all about the cool things their characters are going to do this season. We even got to talk to the showrunners. And they are so enthusiastic about what's going to happen this season on their show. You really have to tune in. You don't want to miss an episode. It's going to be epic. Like I said, your usual PR fluff piece. I've already seen a number of videos where they're rightfully pointing out this article is admitting the Rings of Power has nothing to do with Tolkien. They're using his lore as toilet paper. For me, one paragraph, well, kind of two, but mainly this one paragraph leaped out. To be fair, others have acknowledged what was said is wrong but they breeze past it, move on to other things. Don't address the deeper implications of what is being said. That's what I'm here for. What am I talking about? Sophie Nanvedi's comments. It appears she's the designated race hustler of the Rings of Power. Kind of harsh, don't you think, Randy? Yeah, and I'm going to get a lot harsher before this is all done. Sophie Nanvedi starts with by saying, it was a genre that was closed to me before. Growing up, there was nobody who looked like me in the front and center of fantasy. Sophie is telling us that the only character she's capable of identifying with in literature, movies, TV shows, what have you, are ones that look like her. Sophie says she could never see herself in fantasy. Well, fantasy does have a lot of fantastical creatures. Elves, dragons, dwarves, orcs, goblins, and such. Okay, Sophie can't see herself in these fantastical creatures. She can only see herself in other humans. Wait a minute. Humans are everywhere in fantasy. Oftentimes, they're the focus of the story. In The Lord of the Rings, humans are the point. We're at the end of the Third Age, the age of fantastical creatures, and the beginning of the Fourth Age, and the rise of men. I got it. I got it. I know what's going on here. Sophie's a woman. She can only identify with other women. No, that doesn't work either. Women are everywhere in fantasy. You can make the argument women are the point of the genre. From weak to strong, you have damsels in distress all the way to warrior princesses. There would be lots of women Sophie could identify with. Maybe Sophie can only identify with a very particular type of human woman. Sophie's Rubenesque. She can only identify with curvy women. No, that don't fly either. Fantasy is full of Rubenesque curvy women. Sophie's pretty specific in what she needs to be able to see herself in fantasy. So what's left? What's left? Sexuality? Yeah, but to the best of my knowledge, Sophie's never really talked about her sexuality. In the next sentence that we're going to be looking at here in a bit, she does say she has a daughter. That implies she's either straight or bisexual. But that doesn't work either because a lot of fantasy, the ones that deal with sexuality, often have lesbian bisexual women. And they're often portrayed in a very positive light. What's left? What is the thing that is so important to Sophie that she cannot see herself in fantasy unless it's explicitly represented? Her race, her humanity, her femininity, her physical appearance, her sexuality are all irrelevant. The only thing that matters in being able to identify with a character is if you're of the same race. Sophie, buddy, are you sure that's the argument you want to go with? Because that exact argument has what we like to call a history. A history that people who looked exactly like you were willing to face water cannons, attack dogs, and police batons to the face to put an end to. Let's dissect this argument a little bit, shall we? How are people able to identify with others? 
whether they be in real life or characters up on the screen or in literature. The word is empathy. We're able to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. In literature, TV, movies, what have you, a character's life experiences resonate with us on a personal level. We see ourselves in the character. We project ourselves upon the character and we become the character. For an in-depth discussion of how this process can work, look up the works of Joseph Campbell. What Sophie is saying? She's incapable of identifying with, and more importantly, empathizing with anybody who is not of her race. Again, I'm going to ask the question, Sophie, are you sure you want to make this argument? We got to go back to the second half of the 19th century. Coming out of evolutionary theory, in some quarters, people started making the argument that some groups of humans had evolved faster and further than other groups. A logical question was asked. How do you determine who's superior and who's inferior? All sorts of pseudosciences came along. Bumps on the head and other garbage. But one idea stuck. Inferior people can only empathize with the group the tribe, the race. Superior peoples can empathize with anyone. Out of that came the argument, those people. It depended on what part of the world you were coming from as to who those people meant. But those people can't empathize with us. Therefore, they don't understand us. They're a threat to us. We need to keep them way over there as far away from us as possible. And oh, by the way, they don't deserve the same rights and privileges we have. It was this argument that was used to justify making interracial marriage illegal. A frustrated artist with a funny mustache, in his infamous book, he used this argument to justify his plans. It was this argument that was used to justify segregation and Jim Crow laws in the American South. It was the fight against this idea that led record numbers of African Americans to enlist in the military during World War II. They were willing to die for people that were very different than them. During the civil rights era here in America, people of all colors linking arms, standing up against water cannons, attack dogs, police batons, a very public repudiation of this idea. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail directly attacks this idea. No, I'm the same as you. I have the same belief system, the same attitudes, the same worldviews. I share the same cultural and religious traditions as you do. The only difference, this superficial thing, content of character is what matters. Judge me for who I am, not what I look like. Fast forward to 2024, and we have Sophie Nanvedi saying, no, no, I can't empathize with anybody who doesn't look like me. <laughs> Progress. Now, to be fair to Sophie, this idea has been circulating out there for a while now. Diversity and inclusion. We need to put POCs in films, movies, TV shows, what have you, so POCs can see themselves. But you'll notice what argument is not being made? With the insistence of putting marginalized voices in all of media, there is absolutely no concern that non-marginalized voices will be able to see themselves, empathize with characters that don't look like them. They give up the game and reveal what's really going on with the argument, it's not made for you. What they're saying is, you non-marginalized voices, you don't need this. We're doing this for marginalized voices because they do need this, the poor things. <laughs> it gets a whole lot worse because Sophie goes further to say, I have a four-year-old daughter and she was watching a Disney program the other day and she said, Mama, I wish I was white so I could look like this character. It never happened. I'm going to repeat myself so that there are no misunderstandings. Sophie Nunvedi, or whoever fed the line to the author of this article, lied through their teeth. It never happened. 
First off, that's not the way a four-year-old child speaks. It is the way an activist would speak, though. Why am I so adamant? Research on children's cognitive development is well established. Research about how children understand race goes all the way back to the 1960s. Children under the age of five are incapable of understanding differences between other human beings based upon skin color. The reason is very simple. Children under the age of five struggle to understand abstract symbols. They live in a literal world. They don't see any symbolism in skin color. The only time a child under the age of five will voluntarily express ideas about race is when they've been exposed to those ideas repeatedly. In nice, polite, academic terms, it's called imprinting. When I say Sophie Nanvedi or whoever fed that line to the author of the article was lying, that's the charitable option. The other option manipulating a child to push a political ideological agenda. All of this so a corporation can get a few more views for their flippin' TV show. I ain't done yet, because there's another implication in Sophie Nunvedi or whoever claiming her four-year-old daughter was incapable of seeing herself in a white character. We go back to the very reason why they started doing the research on children and race all the way back in the 1960s. The argument was POCs were incapable of identifying with, experiencing empathy towards anybody outside of their race because they were born that way. It's genetics. 60 plus years of research has consistently showed that ain't true. All racial attitudes are learned behaviors. There's a whole nother problem with this argument about seeing yourself empathy. History. This modern notion about separate races and stuff is less than 200 years old. The origins can be traced back to the 1820s, but in England, the United States, it really didn't gain footing and take off until the 1870s. I laugh every time I hear somebody say, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, all those founding fathers, they were just a bunch of old racists. No, they weren't. They had their problems, but they weren't racist. If you could go back in a time machine, gather a bunch of the founding fathers together, sit them down, and explain to them modern thinking on race, they would laugh you out of the room. They would think you were batshit insane. Their worldview was very different than a modern worldview. Oh yeah? How do you explain slavery then? They didn't try to sugarcoat things. They justified slavery with the oldest excuse in the books. Might makes right. End of story. During the ancient period, what made the Greeks Greek? Language and culture. During the Hellenistic period, there were Greek cities in modern-day Italy, Sicily, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, and even further. They all spoke the same language, shared the same culture. Art, architecture, literature, it was all the same. No distinction. During the Roman Empire, what made you Roman? Speaking Latin, wearing the toga, participating in a Roman lifestyle, engaging in Roman culture. You didn't even have to be from Italy to be the emperor. Ancient China was so huge with so many different groups of people, they didn't have a shared language or a shared culture. So how did they determine if a group was Chinese or not? You got to give the Chinese credit for pragmatism. It was the robes. If you wrapped your robe with one side on top, you were Chinese. But if you wrapped your robe with the other side on top, that meant you were a barbarian. In Native American culture, children were vital to the survival of a tribe. They were so important that tribes would oftentimes go to war with other tribes to steal their children. Being a member of a tribe had nothing to do with your ancestry and everything to do with the culture you were raised in. This whole argument that the only way you can see yourself being represented in literature, movies, TV shows, is if the characters have your same race, sexuality, or whatever checkbox you can think of off of the oppression scorecard is a lie. 
This idea makes the argument that human beings are incapable of feeling empathy towards each other. It claims the only way we can have a connection with another person is if it's like looking into a mirror. It goes against 60 plus years of consistent research and generations fighting and dying to destroy this insidious evil idea. This idea defiles the very idea of art. Art is symbolic communication between an artist and the audience. What makes great art is when that symbolic communication cuts across space, time, geography, race, religion, culture, ethnicity, to touch the human soul. This foul, evil idea goes against one of the messages, I would argue one of the most important messages, in The Lord of the Rings. Beings of all types, putting aside their differences and legitimate gripes with each other, to unite to fight against evil. I wonder why some would want to destroy that message. The race hustlers at Amazon, the Rings of Power, and their convenient dupes, <coughs> Sophie, are wiping their asses with the legacy of Tolkien, wiping their asses with the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and wiping their asses with the values that I hold dear. I believe in the philosophy of the great Mel Brooks. You identify evil as evil, and then you mock the hell out of it. Step one. I just spent the last 15, 20 minutes explaining to y'all why I think what Amazon and the Rings of Power is doing is evil. Step two. <laughs> At any rate, I hope I've given y'all something to think about. And until next time, y'all be safe. If y'all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me mock the hell out of Amazon pretty soon. And while you're at it, feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.